In this tutorial, I will show you how to create your own custom material node groups in Blender. So in this video, I'm going to share with you all the tips and tricks that I know to create your own customizable node groups. And here up on the screen are all of the different topics that I'm going to be going over in this video. So if you're just looking for something specific, then you can check out the video timestamps in the video description. Or if you'd like a complete overview on how to create your own customizable material node groups, then you can watch the entire video. So we're going to start off by going over the basics of how to create your own custom node groups, and we're going to be going over some different shortcuts. And then I'll show you the basics of setting up customizable values. And then I'll go into more detail on how to control control your custom material. So I'll show you how to do things like how to scale the entire material, also how to better organize your nodes and your node wires, how to control other values like the base color and color ramps, and factor values when you're mixing between two materials, how to change the roughness and bump and displacement of materials, and also how to control specific values using a basic driver setup and many different tips and tricks on how to create your own custom material. Now real quick before we start, videos like these are made possible thanks to my supporters, and a great way to help support this channel is by checking out my Ultimate Blender Procedural Material Pack. So as you may know, I do create a lot of procedural material tutorials, and you can actually learn how to create any of my procedural materials by checking out my procedural material tutorial playlist here on YouTube. And in my Ultimate Blender Procedural Material Pack, you will get all of my procedural materials pre-set up in Blender. Blender's asset browser with custom thumbnails, sorted catalogs, and customizable node groups. And you can also check out my procedural material packs if you'd like to purchase packs of 10 materials. You can also get all of my materials individually on my Gumroad store and my Patreon page. And purchasing the materials is a great way to help support me and this channel so I can continue to create these free tutorials. Now at the beginning of this video, I did want to mention that I will be using the Node Wrangler add-on in this tutorial. So if you don't have the Node Wrangler enabled, you can click here on Edit, and you can go to the Preferences, and then over there on the Add-ons tab, you can search for Node Node Wrangler and then check mark the Node Wrangler add-on. And now that the Node Wrangler is enabled, you can hold down the Control and Shift key and then select different nodes, and that is going to preview the node on the object. So I'll be using the Node Wrangler add-on here and there in the video. So as I mentioned, if you're looking for something specific, then you can check out the video timestamps in the description. But let's start off with the basics of how to create a custom node group. So as an example, I'm using my procedural damaged metal material, and I have a tutorial on this material, so links in the description if you'd like to check that out. And this material is also available on my Gumroad and Patreon, and it's also included in my Ultimate Material Pack but you can also follow along using any material that you have. So to create a customizable node group, you first need to just select all the nodes that you want to be in the node group. So I'm gonna click and drag just to box select all of these nodes. Now I'm not gonna select the material output just because I prefer the material output to be outside of the node group. You could select it and join it together in the node group if you wanted to, but I prefer not to select it because it's not really part of the material, it's just the material output. So I'm just going to box select all the nodes except for the material output. And then to create a custom node group, you can press Control G. So Control G is going to join all the selected nodes into a node group, and it's going to bring you inside of the node group. And you can also see that there are now two new nodes right over here and here on either side. So over here we have a group output, and so any values which are going into the group output, you'll be able to see those values outside of the node group. And then the same thing applies right over here, so we also have a group input node, and any value which are going into the group input, you'll be able to see and control outside of the node group. Now, if for some reason you like deleted these nodes, like if I select this and press X to delete it, you can press Shift A, go to the search, and you can search for a group input node and then just add it in again. But make sure you are inside of the node group when you're adding in the group input or the group output. Now we join the node together into a node group and we are inside of the node group right now. Now to go in and out of the node group, you can press the tab key. So the tab key will bring you in and out of the node group if you have the node group selected. And then you can also resize the node group. So I'm just going to click and drag and I can drag this out to make it bigger. And I can also just like drag it over here next to the material output. Now you can also rename the node group just by clicking right here. And then you can just make a name. And the name of the node group can actually be separate from the material name. So you can see this material here, this is the damaged metal material, but 
I can rename the node group to something different if I want to. And that's a point that I wanted to make in this video, and that is that the material is actually separate from the node group. So basically there is a material, and then within that material you can have different node groups and other node setups. And if you wanted to have multiple node groups, you could do that as well within the same material. So this is my procedural moss material. Again, I'll have links in the description if you'd like to check out this moss material. And you can see in this material, I actually have four different node groups. So this is the moss material, but then I have the moss material, I have the moss only material, and then I have some different moss factors. And I actually have two different material outputs. And because this material output is red, it is using this material output. However, if I just select this material output, now it's using this one instead, and so this material output is going into the moss only, and so this is a slightly different moss material where the entire object is moss. So that's just something that I wanted to point out, that you can have multiple node groups within the same material. Now you might have also noticed that there is a drop down here on this custom node group, and this drop down will allow you to select different node groups within your Blender file. So these are all of the custom node groups which are in this Blender file. And so I can actually choose between these so I could take this custom node group and I could change it So I could change it to the moss and now we have the moss material But I'll just change this back to the damaged metal and then I want to put the shader here I want to put that into the surface so that we can actually see the material now this drop down over here This is actually a little bit different because this drop down is the material drop down So it's going to show you all the materials within this blender file Whereas this drop down is going to show you all the custom node groups So again, I just wanted to make you aware that there is a difference between the material and the node group. Now one more thing that I wanted to mention about node groups is that once you have a node group in a Blender file, you can add it just like any other node. So for instance, I can press Shift A, let's go to the search, and I can search for the moss material. I can then click on the moss material, and here it is right here. So I can search for it just like if I were to add any node which is in Blender. And if you don't want to go to the search and type it in, you can also just press Shift A, and then you can go down here to Group, and it's going to show you any node groups that you've created or that you have have in the Blender files data. So as I mentioned, if you want to join nodes together into a node group, you select the nodes and then you press Control G. However, if you want to unjoin nodes from a node group, you can select the node group and then you can press Control Alt G. So Control G will join the nodes together into a node group and then you can press the tab key to go in and out of the node group. And then with the node group selected, you can also press Control Alt G to bring the nodes out of the node group. All right, so now let's go over the basics of how to edit your node group. So as I mentioned, with the node group selected, you can press the tab key, and the tab key will go in and out of the node group. Now inside the node group, if you press the N key, that's going to open up the side panel here. And then you can click right over here on the group tab. And the group tab is going to have settings for the inputs and the outputs. And so these inputs and outputs are going to be linked with the group input and the group output inside your node group. So for instance, if I didn't want this to be called BSDF, right here on the group output, I could double click on this and I could rename it to shader. And when I do that, it's also going to rename this value here to shader on the group output. Now you can also click on the plus here if you want to add a new output. So I can click on this plus here, that's going to add a new output, and you can see it just copied the other one, so now it just has the same name, but I could double click on this, and I could, for instance, rename it to displacement. And then just like we added a group output or a group input by clicking on the plus here, if you want to get rid of a group input or a group output, you can select the output or the input, and then you can click on the minus button, and that will get rid of it. Now, if I wanted to reorganize the inputs and the outputs, you can just click on an input or an output, and then you can click on these arrows here, and that'll bring it up and down. And then also, if you want to change the type, you can change it right here. So these green values, these are shader values, because they are green. But displacement values are not shaders, they are vectors. So if you click here on this type, if you click on the displacement, and then click on the type, you could change it to a vector instead, and now now you can see it's going to be a purple dot. And because we don't have anything plugged into it, it's just added these three values here. So then if I had some displacement that I wanted to add to the group output, I could press Shift A, I could go to the search, and I could search for the displacement node and just add it here. And then I could take the displacement and I could plug that up to the displacement right here. And then if I press the tab key to go out of the node group, I now have this displacement value here, and this is on the output of the node, so it's on this side. So I could take the displacement and I could 
input that into the displacement of the material output. And whatever is going into the material output, that is what you're actually going to be able to see on the object. Now if I hit the tab key to go into the node group, a much easier way to add the group inputs and outputs would just be to add a new value into the socket here. So right here on the group output as well as the group input right over here, there is an extra socket here. And you can add values into it and then it's going to show up right here on the inputs and outputs here on the side panel. And it's also going to show up if you go outside of the node group. So if I go back into the node group, I'm going to go over here. I'm just going to click on the displacement and hit the minus to get rid of it. So so I can now take the displacement here and I can just put that into this gray value here. And when I add this in, it's going to add it right here and it's automatically going to add it as a vector type. And then if I hit the tab key to go out of the node group, we now have a displacement value outside of the node group. And I can just take the value here and I can just put that into the displacement. And then just like we're doing this for the group output, you can do the same thing for the group input. And you're probably going to be using the group input much more because that's where you add all the different custom values. So here's the group input and right up here we we also have a inputs tab and that's going to act exactly the same as the outputs tab. So you can add any values that you want to control into the group input and then you'll be able to control that outside of the node group. So for an example, I have this Musgrave texture right here and we have this scale. And so this will just change the scale of the Musgrave. So I can take the scale value here, I can take this gray dot, and I'm going to put this into the group input. So put it into the extra socket. And you can see it's going to add it right up here. And as I mentioned, you can click on the plus here to add new inputs. You can also click on the minus to get rid of inputs. And then if you have multiple inputs, you can click on these arrows here, and that is going to reorganize them. So now that we have this scale value, I can double click on this if I want to rename it. So you can't actually rename it here, but if you double click right here, you can rename this. And so I want to rename this to Musgrave Scale because it's controlling the scale of this Musgrave texture. So now if I hit the tab key to go out of the node group, we have the Musgrave Scale outside of the node group. And we can change it and it's going to affect the same Musgrave Scale outside of the node group. And we also have this gray value right here. And so if we wanted to add any node into this value, we could do that and then it would control the Musgrave Scale. For an example, I could press Shift A, I could go to the search, and I could search for a value node and I could just drop the value right here. And so this value is simply a number value. And so I could plug the value up to the Musgrave scale. And then I could just change this value. And now since this value is going into the Musgrave scale, that is going to control the Musgrave texture scale of the original Musgrave texture. But in this case, that doesn't really make any sense because I could just delete this value and I could instead just use this scale right here. And so if I hit the tab key to go back into the node group, I can continue to add more and more values into this group input. So let's say I also want to control the detail of the Musgrave, I could plug this in here. And then if I click right here to rename this, I could rename it to Musgrave Detail. And then let's add some more values. So I could also add the dimension, plug that in there. I could also add this noise texture scale. So I could drag this and plug that in there. And I could click on this to rename it. And I'm going to rename it to noise scale. And then let's say I wanted the noise scale to be above the Musgrave scale. If I click on the noise scale, I can click on the arrows here and I can bring it up. So now that it's on the top, if I go outside of the node group by hitting the tab key, you can see the noise scale is now on the top. And so I can drag this around to control the noise scale. And you can just continue to add really any custom value into the group input. Now something else to note is that you can choose a default value for these different custom values. So if I hit the tab key to go into the node group, right over here on the inputs, if you want to see all of them, you can click here on these little dots and drag this out. And if you click on these, there's going to be some different settings here. But right here on any of the values, you can see there is a default value that you can choose. So if I just go outside of the node group, I can drag the noise scale around. And let's just say that I like 4 as the default scale. So now if I hit the tab key to go into the node group, if I click on the noise scale, right here on the default, it's just set it up automatically to the value that we originally added. So when we plug this in, it was at 3.3, but I could click on the default here and I could change it to four. Now why setting the default value is important is because if I press the tab key to go out of the node group, let's just say that I've added a new material and I want to add in a custom node group that I've created. Well, I can press shift A, I can go to the search and I can search for the damaged metal, I can drop this here and you can see now the noise scale is set to 4 on default. So that's why you may want to set a default value so it's already at a value that you like.
And then as well as controlling the default value, you can also control the maximum and minimum values. So for instance, let's take this Musgrave detail. So if I drag the Musgrave detail down, if I turn it way down to like a very small number, you can see it just looks all lumpy and that doesn't look very realistic. So let's say I wanted the Musgrave detail to have a minimum value of seven. So seven, you can see seven is pretty detailed, but you may also want it to be all the way to the maximum value, which is 15. So if I hit the tab key to go into the node group, you can go right up here to the inputs and I can click on the Musgrave detail. And right down here you have minimum and maximum values. So I didn't like the minimum value being anything smaller than 7 because it just didn't look very realistic. So here on the minimum value, I can click on this and I can change it to 7 and then you could choose a maximum value. I'm going to leave it at 15. So now if I press the tab key to go out of the node group, I can drag the Musgrave detail up to the max of 15. But if I try to drag it down to 0, you can see the minimum value value is 7. Now if I type in a specific value that will override the value, so if I click on this and just type in like 1, and you can see it looks all lumpy now and it's not very detailed, so you can override that just by typing in a manual number. But if I turn this up and then try to turn it down, you can see 7 is the minimum value. And then one other custom setting that I wanted to show you, if I tab to go back into the node group, if I click on the Musgrave detail, you can see here there is a hide value. So if I check mark the hide values, now if I tab to go out of the node group, you can see the Musgrave detail is still in the custom node group, but I don't actually have a value that I can drag around. However, I do have a number value slot here, and so I could plug any value up to the Musgrave detail. So for instance, I could press Shift A, I could go to the search, and I could search for like a value, and I could drop the value right here, and then I could plug the value up to the Musgrave detail. So this way, now this value is going to control the Musgrave detail. Now I find this setting not very useful, I haven't really used it for any of my custom materials, but I thought I'd mention it in this video if any of you find it useful. Now as well as controlling the different custom values for the different textures and the other nodes, you can do the same things for the different shaders. For instance, the principal shader, this is probably the shader which you most commonly use. You can again just plug all the different values into the group input. Now later in this video, I'll be going into more detail on different complex setups, like for instance, how to control color ramps and how to control the different colors of your material and also how to control values if you have a texture going into the shader. Later. So I'll be going over those more complex things later in this video and of course you can check the timestamps in the description to jump to a certain part. But you can control any of these other values on the shader just like we did with the textures. So for instance maybe the metallic value if I want to control whether it's more metallic or less metallic I could drag this over here and I could stick it here into the group input. Another thing I could do is I could just drag the group input over here for now just so that it's a bit closer. Um, I could also put the roughness value in here and also the base color so if I just wanted to change the base color here, I could take the yellow dot here on the base color and I could put that into the group input. And then of course I can reorganize these. So maybe I want the base color to be on top. I could click on the arrows and bring it up here. I could also double click on this to rename it and I could just rename it to color. And then when you go outside of the node group, you can see all the different values. So there is the roughness, there is the metallic, and there is also the color here. Now another cool custom value that I wanted to show you is how to change the random seed of a texture. So the procedural textures in Blender often have the dimension value right here, and on default they are set to 3D. However, I could change this to 4D, and if I change it to 4D, the texture will change a little bit. I have the Node Wrangler enabled, so if I just Control Shift and select the Musgrave texture, you can see the difference between 3D and 4D. So it does change a little bit. It does change the kind of the location, it does look a bit different, but if I now change it to 4D, we have this W value. And you can use this W value basically as a random seed. And you can do this for pretty much any of the other textures. So if I control shift and select the noise texture to preview it, I could click on the 3D here, I could change it to 4D, and now I have this cool W value here, and I can drag this around to change the random seed of the noise. So then what I could do is take the W value, I could stick this right in here, and then I could click on this to rename it, and I could could, for instance rename it to noise seed. Now if I go outside of the node group and I control shift and select the shader to preview the final material I could drag the noise seed around and you can see that is going to change the noise for the damaged part of the metal. Now this brings me to the next topic that I wanted to talk about and that is how you can take one value and you can use it to control multiple values. So if I hit the tab key to go into the node group let's say I want to control the W values for both this Musgrave and this 
this noise at the same time. And you could really do this for any amount of textures. Well, what you can do is you can actually drag multiple values into the same socket. So instead of putting this into a new socket, I could, if I wanted to, I could put it into the new socket here, and then I would have another W value here for the Musgrave. But let's say I wanted one value, which is gonna control the random seed for both textures. Well, I can just take the W and I can put that into the noise seed here. And then if I double click on this to rename it, instead of it being called noise seed, I could maybe rename it to texture seed. So now if I go outside of the node group, I can drag the texture seed, and as well as it changing the noise, which is the dark gray right there, it's also gonna change the rust, which is kind of that orange color. Now the only problem with this is if you have different number values that you want to be applied on both of the textures. So for an example, I'm just gonna get rid of all these input sockets here just so that it's a bit more simple and we can kind of restart. So let's say that I wanna have one custom value, which is gonna control the detail of multiple textures. But this Musgrave texture, I want to be at the max of 15, but then let's say for some reason on the noise texture, I only wanna have a maximum detail of six. You can see here's the noise texture and it's not very detailed, and then here's the Musgrave and it's very detailed. Well, if I put the detail into the group input and then also take this detail here and put it into the group input, it's going to use the same number value because it is going into the same socket. So if I go out of the node group, now this detail is changing both details at once. So I'm not able to have two different detail levels if I want to control the detail level with one value. However, there is a way to fix this. So if I go inside the node group, what I can do is press shift A, I can go to the search, and I can search for a math node. So I can click on the math node, and I'm going to drop it here between the group input and the noise texture detail. And then in this case, what I need to do is take the detail here, and I need to put it into the bottom value and then because I want to make this a smaller detail amount I want to click on the add and I want to change it to divide instead so I can now drag this divide value around on the math node and this divide is basically going to offset this noise texture detail so I could make the detail amount very small by turning the divide up you can see now it's not very detailed it's all lumpy but then over here this is the Musgrave texture and that's very detailed however if I go outside of the node group Group, I can now drag the detail around and it's going to control the detail of both textures at once. But I'm using the math node to offset the number value of the noise detail. And I could do the same thing, but the opposite way around. So let's say that I wanted the noise texture detail to be much higher. I could click on the divide and I could instead change it to multiply. And then I could just turn this value way up. So now if I go outside of the node group, I could turn this detail amount way down. And now because the detail amount is turned way down, the must Musgrave texture is not very detailed at all. It looks all lumpy, but you can see the noise right over here is still very, very detailed. And again, that's because I'm offsetting this value by multiplying the number before it goes into the noise texture detail. So this can be very helpful if you want more control over the different customizable values. All right, now the next topic of this video is how to better organize the node groups. So sometimes when you're making a really large procedural material, the nodes can become quite messy and can be hard to use. So I'm now going to go over a few different tips and tricks on how to organize your nodes better. Now one thing that I did want to mention is that you can actually change the curve of your node wires. And you can see that my node wires are very straight and that's because I've set that up in Blender's user preferences. So to edit the curve of your node wires, you need to go into Blender's user preferences by clicking here on edit and then clicking on preferences. Click over on the themes button and then you're going to click on the node editor. Just open this up and you you can scroll way down. And here on the bottom, you can see that there is this noodle curving. Now on default in Blender, I believe it is turned to five, but I prefer to turn it to zero just because I like that better. But you could also turn it up higher if you want, like 10, but I don't really like how that is. And then you can also click on the save preferences button, or it might be that the auto save preferences is already turned on. So I'm just gonna close the user preferences. Now another great way to organize your nodes is to add reroutes. So you can press shift A and you can go to here to the search and you can search for a reroute and a reroute is just going to be one of these little dots here but an easier way to do this is to instead hold down the shift key and then right click and drag over a wire and let go and that is going to add a reroute here so it's just a little dot and you can kind of drag it around so then what I could do is hold down the shift key and right click and drag and let go to add another one I could like drag this down here and if I wanted to like join all of the same wires into the reroute I could also hold 
down the shift key and I could right click and drag over all these wires and then let go. And you can see it's gonna join them all together into the same reroute. And if you're ever wondering what value the reroute is, it's always going to be the value of the other input which is behind it. So basically it's just extending the noise texture factor out here and then all the different wires are going into the color ramps and the other nodes. So I could drag these reroutes around, maybe bring this one up here. And also right here, you can see there's like a wire which is overlapping before this wire goes into the bump. So again, I could hold down the shift key, right click and drag and then let go. And then I could drag this over here. And I could like stick it down there. Also right up here we have a color ramp and then we have this wire here going into this mix. So I could like drag this up here and drag this down and that way the wire isn't overlapping. Or what I could also do is hold down the shift key and right click and drag over the wire. And I could like drag this down here so that maybe it is more straight. I could also drag this up here. And then we also have another wire which is overlapping this node. So I could hold down the shift key, right click and drag and maybe drag this down here. Now another great way to organize your nodes is to rename the nodes. So as I mentioned earlier, you can rename the node groups, but you can actually rename each one of these nodes. So right here on this Musgrave texture, even though this is a Musgrave texture, I could rename it to whatever I want. So to rename a node, you can select the node, and then you can press F2, and that is going to add a node label. So because this is controlling the rust, I could rename it to rust texture. And I could do that for many other things. So right here, like on this mix node, this mix node is controlling the rust color. So even though this is a mix node, I could select it and I could press F2 to add a label and I could just call this like rust color. Or if I wanted to, I could call it rust color, but then add the little mix at the end so that I can remember that this is a mix node. And then just like all nodes, you can drag out the sides if you want to make them bigger or smaller. I could also rename these bump nodes. So if I control shift and select this color ramp, this color ramp is controlling where the rust is. And so the color is going into this bump here. So I could click on this bump. I could press F2 to add a label and I could call this rust bump. So now it's easy to remember what bump node this is controlling because it has a label here. Now another great way to organize your nodes is by adding frames. So as an example, all of these mix nodes are controlling the colors. So I could click and drag to box select all these nodes here and then I could press control J. Control J is going to join them together into a frame and I need to kind of move some of these nodes away. So I'm gonna box select these nodes, move them back a little bit and now we have this cool frame right here. And also I wanna click and drag, and then I just wanna drop this reroute here into the frame. So I can now click on the frame and I could drag the frame around and you can see it's gonna control all the nodes here. Now you can also rename the frames. So if I click on the frame, I could press F2 and that is going to add a label to the frame and I could just call this base color. So now it's easy to remember that these nodes are controlling the base color. And then if for some reason I wanna bring a node out of a frame, if I click on the node, I can press Alt P and Alt P will bring the node out of the frame or I can just drag it here in the frame and then click and then it will drop it inside the frame. And another way to add frames is just to press Shift A, go to the search and you can just search for a frame and you can just add it here and then you can just drag any nodes that you want into it. So for instance, I could drag this down here and then I could drag this texture up here and just drop it in and also this texture here, I could just drop it in and then I can drag this around and it will drag around all of the textures. And another cool thing about the frames is I can actually change the color of them. So here on this base color frame, if I click on this frame, if you press the N key to open up the side panel, you can click here on node and make sure you have the frame selected and there's actually a color right here. So I can click on the drop down and I can click here to turn on the color and then I could make this whatever color I want. So for instance, I could make it like a dark blue color. That's pretty cool. And I could go over here to this one here, click on this, I could turn on the color and this one maybe I could make like an orangey color and you can also change the color of different nodes so for instance right here on this principal shader I could click on this and if I click right over here on node right here on the color I could turn this on and then I could make this whatever color I want so for instance I could make it a green color so visually this might just look kind of nice to kind of separate things and if I hit the tab key to go out of the node group I can actually make a color for my node group so if I click on the damaged metal again 
then on the side panel here, if you go to node, you can click on color and then I could make this whatever color I want. So maybe an orange color would look pretty cool. Now, another way to organize your nodes inside of node groups is you can actually collapse nodes. And if you collapse nodes, it's only going to show you the values that you are using. Here on this principled shader, there might be a bunch of values that I'm not using. And so just to make it a bit more simple, I don't want to see all these extra values. So if you click on the principled shader or any other node, you can press control H and control H is going to collapse the node. So now it is smaller, but because there are values going into the base color and the normal, we still have sockets for those. So again, with the node selected, just press control H, control H will collapse or uncollapse the node. And I can do the same thing for these mixes here, or also these color ramps, or also any of these textures just by pressing control H. And another way to collapse nodes is to click on the little arrow here. So let's say I just want to make this really small. I could just click on this arrow here and that's going to make it very small, but you can still see that there's all those dots there. So what I could do is press control H then I could click on the arrow here and that's going to make it really small. So if you have a giant node setup with lots of nodes and you want to make it really small, you could just make that very minimal and it looks very clean and neat. Now, another way to organize your nodes is you can actually add node groups within other node groups. So for an example here, I'm using my mossy dirt material and I have a tutorial on how to create this. And you can also purchase this mossy dirt material on my Gumroad store and Patreon page. And this mossy dirt material is also in my ultimate procedural material pack. So if I hit the tab key to go into the node group, you can see I've added a frame for the dirt and I've also added a frame for the moss because this mossy dirt material is actually made out of two different shaders. So we have the moss shader and then the dirt shader, and then I'm using this mix shader to mix them together. And so these frames are pretty nice. They're a nice way to organize the nodes, but what I could do instead is create node groups for just the moss and just the dirt. So just to show you, I'm going to select the frames and I'm going to press X to delete it click on this frame and press X to delete it. So I can now click and drag and I can box select all of the moss nodes and then I could press control G to join it together into a node group. And you can see in this node group, there are inputs and outputs just like with the other node groups. And again, you can tab to go in and out of the node group. So then I could make this much bigger just that it looks nicer. I can also rename it. And now we just have a node group for our moss. I can do the same thing for the dirt. So I can click and drag just to box select all these nodes and I can press control G and then I can hit the tab key to go out of the node group and I can drag this out to make it bigger. And right here I can rename this so I could rename it to dirt. So I now have a node group for the moss and the dirt, but if I want to go out of the main node group, I just need to select one of the other nodes, which isn't a node group. And then I can press the tab key. So now we have the mossy dirt and we still have all the different custom values, but inside this node group, we have another node group. All right, so I've just brought back my original damaged metal material. And there's one more really great feature that I want to show you on organizing your node groups better. So if I go into this damaged metal material, you can see this looks quite messy. And one reason why it looks very messy is because this group input has tons of little values and tons of little wires. And if I drag this around, you can see all the wires are going over each other and it just looks super messy. But there's actually a really great feature to organize this better. And that is that you can actually add multiple group inputs and multiple group outputs. So you can press shift A, you can go to the search and you could search for a group input and you can see it's going to basically link the same data because you can really only have one node group within a node group. It's going to link the same data so that outside of the node group, you have all the different custom values. So you can add it that way, or you can also just select the group input and you can press shift D to duplicate it. So I can take this duplicated group input node and I can drag it right over here next to these mix nodes. And then what I want to do is press the N key to open up the side panel. And just to make things more simple, I will get rid of all of these other custom values. So we just have the scale. So now that I have this group input here, you can see the data is linked. So this group input is going to have the same data as this one over here. So what I can do is take this group input and then I can put all the colors into it. So I can take the color here from this mix, put that in there. I can also take the mix from here, put that in there. And then also this white color here, drag that in there. And this one in here, I can drag that in there. So now the wires aren't going nearly as far. They are still overlapping a little bit, but I could kind of drag these around to make it look a bit nicer. 
nicer, but instead of all of these wires going all the way across the material and kind of stretching and overlapping over all the nodes, they're just right over here. Now one thing that you're going to need to be careful of is that you don't accidentally put two different values into the same socket, because now this group input over here has these different sockets. And so I wouldn't want to accidentally take a different node, like for instance the Musgrave texture detail, I wouldn't want to put that here in A, because now A is controlling the color as well as the Musgrave texture detail. So that's just something to be aware of. But if I just rename these, I can keep track of all the values. So you can continue to do that by duplicating the group input. So I can take this group input, I can press Shift D to duplicate it, and I can drop it like down here. And if I wanted to control any of these other values on the principal shader, I could drag this in here. I could also drag this one in here. So already this material is looking quite a bit more organized because we have this group input here, which is controlling the colors. We then have this one over here, which is controlling some of the other values. And then this one down here, that's controlling the bump. And then this one over here, this can control the textures and the mapping. Now, once you're finished with all of this to make the group input inputs look even nicer, you can collapse the group inputs. Because you can see there's all these extra values here, but we don't want to plug anything up to these values because they're being used on the other group inputs. So what you can do at the very end, once you've created your entire node group, is you can hold down the shift key and you can select all of the group inputs. Then I can press control H and control H is going to collapse the group inputs. So it's now only going to display the values which are plugged into those group inputs. And you could also click on this little arrow here if you want to make it even smaller. So again, Control H is the shortcut key to collapse and uncollapse the different nodes. So now that these are collapsed, they look even nicer because it's only displaying the values that they are using. All right, so the next thing that I'm going to show you is how to scale the size of the entire material with one single value. And as an example, I've added in my procedural damaged plaster material. Again, links in the description if you'd like to check out that tutorial. And you can also purchase the damaged plaster on my Gumroad store and my Patreon page. But this isn't actually the final material because I've removed all of the scale values for demonstration in this video. So I'm going to go inside the node group. So to scale the entire material at once, I need some way to be able to scale all the scale values of the texture. And this damaged plaster has four different main procedural textures. And so that's why I'm using it for demonstration in this video, in case you have a very complex material. So if you just have one single material, it might be as easy as just taking the scale. For instance, let's just take the noise scale, and you could put the scale into this value. Now if I go outside of the node group, you can use the scale to change the size of it. But this isn't actually scaling the entire material, it's just scaling the noise, which is the damaged plaster. Now what I could do if I go back into the node group is I could just take all of the scale values from all the textures and I could put it into the same scale value. So I could put the scale in here, but the problem with this, if I press Control Z to undo that, the problem with this is that these all have different scale values. So this one here is 1.5, this one here is also 5, then we have these two at 7, and then this one at 40. And if I plugged all the scale values into the same socket here, then they would all use this same scale value. So what we can do instead is we can add a mapping node and we can plug the mapping node up to the vector of the Voronoi texture. Now on this original material, I already had a texture coordinate and mapping node, but I deleted it just for demonstration in this video. So if you have the node wrangler enabled, what you can do is select one of the textures and then you can press control T and that is going to add the texture coordinate and mapping nodes. And I always use these when I'm creating procedural materials because I like to use the object coordinates. And the object coordinates help to place the texture on the objects more evenly. That just works best for most procedural materials. So what I can do now is I can take the vector and I can put that into every vector value of all the textures in your entire material. So now that I've done that, we have the location, the rotation, and scale on the mapping. And I can change these and that is going to affect the entire material because we've plugged it up to all the textures. So now what we can do is we can just take the scale here on the mapping and we can put that into the group input. Now if I press the tab key to go out of the node group, you can see it's transferred over the x, y, and z values. And in some cases you may want this, so you may actually want to scale the material individually by each axis, but I instead want this to be one single value. So to change it to one single value, we're going to go into the node group, and then you can click here on the scale value on the side panel if you click over here on group. 
So right now it is set to vector and that is because the mapping is vector. It is a purple dot, but I can click on vector and I can change it to float instead. This way it's going to use one single value because float is going to be number values. Now you can see it's gotten rid of the texture, but that's just because I need to hit the tab key to go out of the node group. And then here on the scale, I need to turn it back to the default of one. And now you can see the texture. And now I can scale it just by dragging around this one single value. Now something else that's important to know is that when you go back into the node group, when I turned the type to float, you can see it turned the default value to zero. You need to make sure you turn the default back to one or whatever default value you want. And why it's important to have a default value is because if I go out of the node group, let's say I want to add in this damaged plaster to this material. I can press shift A, I can go to the search or go down here to group and I can search for the damaged plaster. Here's the damaged plaster so I can just add this in. So I've added it in as a new node and they are the same node, but you can see now the scale value has been turned to one. Whereas if I didn't have the default value set to one, then this scale value would be turned to zero. And if I turn it to zero, now if I plug the shader up to the surface, you can see it's gotten rid of the texture. So that just makes things a bit easier in the future when you're using the material to make sure that you have a default scale. Now normally when you add in data, it's automatically going to add the default scale. So for instance, like this detail right here, this is set to 15. So if I just drag the detail into the extra socket here and then click here on detail, you can see it's automatically set the default value to 15. So that's just something to note if you're ever changing the type here. All right, so for my my next example, I've added in my wood three material. Again, I'll have a link in the description to this material, and you can also purchase this material on my Gumroad and Patreon. Now, another value that you might want to add to your node group are the other values of the mapping. And so real quick, I've added a mapping node here to show you the mapping. So with a mapping, we have a scale, and I already talked about that, how you can plug the scale in, but this mapping node also has location and rotation values. And so with some materials, you may want to control the location and rotation as well as the scale and I've done that for my wood 3 material now why I've added the rotation to the wood material is because wood grain has a consistent pattern and the wood is going in a certain angle so depending on what object you're adding this to you might want to change the rotation of the grain so if I want the grain of wood to be going back and forth I can change the Y rotation to 90 and now on this object here the grain of wood is going back and forth so if you want to change the rotation of the entire material at once then you can go into the node group and I've already done it here. You can see what I've done is I've just taken the mapping rotation and I've just put that into the extra socket and then it added it as a rotation. And you can do the same thing for the location. So if for some reason you want to move the location of the entire material around, you can go here into the node group and you can take the location socket here and you can put that into the extra socket and then you could rename it or move it around if you want to. And so if I go out of the node group, you can now see that we have location values. So we have an X location and a Z and a Y location. Now let's say on the location, rotation, or scale, you wanted to control one or two of the values, but not all three. So we've already talked about how to control all the values at the same time. And if you want to control all three values individually, then you can plug the location, rotation, or scale up to the group input. However, what if you want to control just one or two of the values? Well, to do that, I've added in my procedural chocolate bar material. Again, I'll have links in the description to this material. And with this material, I wanted to control the bar pieces X scale and the bar pieces Y scale, but not the Z scale. Because the X scale and the Y scale will go back and forth, but I don't want to change the Z scale because the Z is going up and down. So I've just deleted the X and Y scale on this chocolate bar material so that we can add it now. And I'll show you how to control just one or two values, but not three. So if I go into the node group of this chocolate bar material, here is this mapping. And if I change these values, I can change the size of those pieces of the chocolate bar. However, if I drag it to a certain amount, like right here, you can see it's going to mess up the texture of the chocolate bar. So I don't want to be able to control the Z scale, but I do want to be able to control the Y and X. So I'm going to press shift A, let's go to the search, and I'm going to search for combine, and let's add the combine XYZ node. So now what I can do is I can take the scale or the rotation and location, just depending on whatever you're using, and I'm going to put that into the vector. This way it's going to take those three scale values from the mapping and it's going to break it up into a individual X, Y, and Z values. Now just to copy over the same X, Y, and Z scale, I'm going to unplug this real quick and then I can 
hover my mouse over the X value, press Control C, and then press Control V to paste that. And I'm just gonna do the same thing for the Y and the Z. So I'm just copying the value and then pasting it in here. So now the X, Y, and Z all have the same values. So I can put the scale into the vector, and so that's broken up the three values. So let's put the X in here, and then also the Y into the extra socket. And then right here, of course, you could rename those values. So now if I tab to go out of the node group, we have the X here, so I can change that scale, and we have the Y here, but it's not affecting the Z. All right, so I've added a new material, and I'm now gonna show you how to control custom color values. So I've just added new material. I have this principal shader here, and real quick, I'm gonna make a very basic material, but if you already have your own material, you can just use your own material. So what I'm gonna do is press Shift A, and I'm gonna to search for a noise texture and then I will press Control T with the noise texture selected and I'm going to plug the object up to the mapping. So I can now take the noise texture factor and I want to put that into the base color. Now a very common thing that I do when I'm creating procedural materials is I use a color ramp to change the colors. So I'll press Shift A and I'm going to add a color ramp and let's put the color ramp between the noise texture and the base color. So I can now change the two tabs here on the color ramp to actually change the colors of that noise. So let's just maybe make this one green and then this one over here let's just make it blue and then I want to join this together into a node group so I'm going to box select all these nodes and I'll press Control G so if you just have a very simple material that doesn't have a texture going into the base color of the shader you can take the base color of the principal shader or whatever shader you're using and you could just plug that up to the group input however very often you are going to have some sort of texture which is affecting the base color so what if you want to control these colors well on the color ramp here it only has the factor but the factor has the noise texture going into it and we don't have any other sockets here that we can plug into the group input so I do really like using the color ramp, but unfortunately it doesn't work very well when you're creating custom node groups. So if you just have two colors on each side, then a really easy way to create custom colors is to just add a mix node after the color ramp. So I'm going to press Shift A, let's go to the search, and I'm going to search for the mix node, and let's drop this up here. And then on default it's set to float, and float is number values, but I want to click on this and change it to color instead. Then we can drop the mix node here between the color ramp and the base color. So instead of putting the color ramp into the color, we can put it here into the factor of this mix. And the factor is determining where it's going to be color A and where it's going to be color B. So it's actually best if you put a black and white value into the factor. So what I'm actually going to do is just click on these colors here and I'm going to transfer them over to the mix. So I can take this blue color, I can click and drag and drop the color into this, and then I can click here on this color, and I can click and drag and drop it here into value A. So now if I select select this color ramp, I want to reset it. So I'm just going to, with the color ramp selected, hit the backspace and that's going to reset the color ramp. So we now have this color ramp and this color ramp is going into the factor and the factor is determining where it's going to be color A and where it's going to be color B. And to show you this better, if I drag the white tab over, the whiter areas are telling it that it's going to be color B, but then wherever the black areas are, that's telling it that it's going to be color A. So if you have a very simple setup with like a noise texture and a color ramp, you can easily add this mix node. And now that we have the mix node, we have these values here. So I can plug this here into the extra socket or I'll actually just plug it up here, and then I can plug color B up to the extra socket. And then of course, if you press the N key to open the side panel, you can rename the inputs and the outputs. So if I now go out of the node group, we have the different custom colors. So I could make this like a green color, and this one here, I could make like a blue color. So this is a very easy way to control the color values if you're just using a very simple color ramp with two colors. But let's say that you have a color ramp which has multiple colors. So what I'm going to do is click on the group input, and right here I'm going to hit the minus just to get rid of those, and then I will click on the mix, and I will delete it. And let's plug the color back up to the base color. So to make this more complex, I'm going to make four different colors. So I will hold down the control key and then click right here and hold down the control key and click here to add more colors. And then real quick I'm just going to make these a bunch of different colors. So I'll make like a blue color. Let's also do like a red color and I'll do green. 
So we now have a bunch of different colors and that is going into the base color. So because we have a bunch of different colors, we have more than two colors. We can't simply add a mix node and drop it in here and then copy the colors over. So to fix this, what we need to do is use this color ramp data and we need to make different color ramps and we're going to use those color ramps to make different black and white values. And the different black and white values will be for each one of these colors. And then we can take each one of those factors and we can mix them all together with mix nodes. So what I first want to do is just create a mask of where the blue colors are. So to do this, I'm going to click on this color ramp and I'm going to press Control Shift D. So Control Shift D will duplicate the node, but it'll keep the wire plugged up. And I now want to delete these other two tabs, but I just want to keep these two first tabs. So I'm going to click on this tab and then I can hit the minus button and this tab here, I can click on the minus button. So we now just have these two tabs here. So I now just want to make these two tabs white and black because we are creating a mask or a factor value. So here on the red tab, I'm going to click on this. I'll go here to the RGB and I want to turn all of these up to one. Then here on the blue, I can click on this one and this one I want to make fully black. So if I control shift and select this color ramp, this is where all the blue parts are. So this blue color right here on the original color ramp, that is showing up right here and a few other spots. It's kind of subtle, but it is there. So I now want to do the same thing, but for the other colors. So I'm going to click on this color ramp. I'll press control shift D and I'm going to drop it up here above the first one. Now on the first color ramp, we use the first and second, but on this color ramp, I want to use the second and third. So I'm going to click on this color here. I'll click on the minus and then click on this color here, click on the minus to get rid of it. So now we just have the second and third values. And it is important that these values are at the same exact positions. And so that's why I duplicated them from this color ramp. So back here on this color ramp, we want to take this one and we want to make it fully black. And then this one here, this green one, I want to click on the color and we want to turn all the values to one so that it is fully white. So now if I control shift and select this color ramp, this is going to be the mask of where the red parts are. If I control shift and select the color ramp, you can see it is matching up with the same location. So I can do the same exact thing. So I'm going to click on this color ramp. I'll press control shift D and I'm going to drop it up here. And then I just want to use the third and fourth. So I'll click on this one. Let's hit the minus to get rid of it. And this one here, click on the minus to get rid of it. So then again, this one right here, we want to make this fully black. So that's the third one. And then here on the fourth one, I want to click on this one here. And this one, I want to make all the values to one. So the red, green, and blue to one so that it is fully white. And this one is going to control the green values. If I control shift and select the color ramp, you can see that's where the green values are. And if I control shift and select the color ramp, you can see the green values are in these large areas. And you can just continue to do this as many times as you need so that you create masks for all the colors. So now I'm going to show you how to mix them all together. So what I first want to do is take this color ramp and we're going to put it into a mix to control the black and the white colors. So let's press shift A. I can go to the search and I can search for a mix. Let's drop this here. And then we are working with color values. So let's click on the float and I can change this to color instead. And then I can take the color and I can put that into the factor. And again, the factor is controlling where it's going to be color A and where it's going to be color B. So I now want to take the original color ramp and I want to add the same values. So let's take this red color. I can put it into B and then I can click here on the blue color and I can click and drag the color and I can drop the color here into A. So now if I control shift and select the mix, I can control shift and select between these and you can see the colors are at the correct spot because you can see there's that little blue blob there and it's at the same location as this color ramp. So now we can continue to add more and more mixes and we can mix them all together. So I'm going to click on this mix. Let's press shift D to duplicate it and I can drop it here. So I now want to take this mix result and I want to put this into color A. And then we want to take the other color ramp here. This is the factor for the green color and let's put the color into the factor. So again, that's telling it where it's going to be A and where it's going to be B. So we can now go back here to our original color ramp and we can click on the green color and we can drag and drop the color into color B. So click on this mix and press shift D to duplicate it. Let's drop it here and we can take the result and we can put that into color A. Then we want to take this color ramp here and this is controlling where the purple is going to be. So let's take the color. I can put that into the factor. 
and then I can control shift and select this mix and I want to take this purple color and let's put that into B. So it is really hard to see and it actually looks kind of blue because it's blending with the green color but if I now hold down the control and shift key and select between the original color amp and the mix you can see they look exactly the same. There is no difference. So I can now bring the principal shader up and I can replace this mix for our original color ramp. So let's put the result into the base color. And then I can control shift and select the principal shader to preview it. So now that we've done that, I can drag the group input over here and we can plug up all the custom colors. So I can just plug these all up here. So I'll plug up A and B and then also this one here and then also this one here. And then of course, as I've talked about earlier, right over here on the side panel, you can rename all these. So for instance, I could just rename this to like color one and I could rename all of the colors. So if I now go outside of the node group, we have all the different custom colors. And while we're on the subject of changing the custom colors, I wanna show you another way to change the custom colors. So if I go back here into the node group, another way that you can add custom colors is by adding the hue saturation value node. So if I just press shift A, I'm going to go here to the search. I can search for hue and I'm going to add the hue saturation value node and I can put this here between the mix and the base color. So if I bring the group input here I can just drop the hue in and the saturation and the value and now if I go outside of the node group I can easily change the hue which is going to change the colors, the saturation which will change how colorful the colors are and also the value to make it brighter or darker. So those are some really useful custom values that you might want to use. Alright so I've shown you how to convert a color ramp to this node setup right here with these other color ramps and the mix and that way we can control the colors outside of a node group. However, if I go back into the node group, if I wanted to move the color ramp position values around to make the colors more or less contrasty, you can see here on the color ramp we don't have any of these extra sockets here to control the position value of the tabs. So if you want to control the position values of these tabs, we can set up some basic drivers. So just take the group input, I'm just going to bring it over here, and what I first want to do is just rename all these just so that it's better organized. So I now want to create a new input here, and that input we're going to add a driver which is going to control the position values. So right over here on the inputs let's click on color 1 and then I can click on the plus here and that is going to add a new input. Now we don't want to use a color value so let's click on the type here and we want to change it to float instead because float is going to use number values. Now right here on color 1 if I double click on this I'm going to call it color 1 position. Now because we're going to be using a driver we actually don't want to plug anything up to this color 1 position. So if I go outside side of the node group we now have this color one position here and this is going to control where this color is. So now to create a driver I first want to copy the data path. So right here on this color one position, I want to right click on this and then I want to click on copy data path. And just to show you what this is doing, I've brought up a text file on my computer and I'm going to press control V to paste what we copied. So this data right here, this is the text that we copied and this data is what the driver is going to use to know what value is going to control the color ramp positions. So now that we've right clicked here and copied the data path of this color one position, I'm going to tab to go into the node group and for the color one, that is going to be this color right here. So if I drag this around, you can see it's more or less contrasty. So right here on this black tab, what I want to do is add a position value right here because that's controlling where the black tab is. So I'm going to right click and then we're going to click on add driver and then this driver setting will come up. And if for some reason you move your mouse out of the way and the driver setting goes away, you can see this is purple here and that's telling us that it has a driver applied to it. So you can just right click again and then you can click on edit driver and the driver settings will come back. Now right here on the type, we don't want this to be a scripted expression. We want this to be some values because we just want to add a number value. And then we need to delete this variable and add a new one so that we can change the type of it. So I'm going to click on the X here to get rid of this variable. And then we can click on add input variable. Now right down here on this prop, we want to click on this to change the ID type. And because we're working with materials, we just want to change this to material. Then right here on the dropdown, there are quite a few materials, but I want 
want to add the material which I'm currently using. Now we have a path and if we click on the path, we can press control V and then enter and that is going to paste the data that we copied earlier. And then just to make sure it's fully updated, you can just click on update dependencies and then move your mouse out of the way. So if I now hit the tab key to go out of the node group, we have this color one position and I can drag this around. And now if I go back in the node group, you can see now the position has been moved and this color one position is now controlling the position value of this black tab. Now, if you want to make your material look exactly the same as the original color ramp, then you need to make sure that these position values are the same as the position values on these color ramps. So this one right here, this is at the very starting. So the position value is zero. So if I just go outside of the node group, this color one position, I can just turn to zero. So I'm now going to do the same thing for color two. So I'm going to go into the node group. Let's click here on color two. I can click on the plus here because we want to create a new value here or a new input. And I want to rename this one to color two position. Now here on the type, I want to click on the color and I want to change it to float instead because we just want to use number values. So I can now hit the tab key to go outside of the node group and we want to right click on this. And then again, we want to click on copy the data path so that we copy the text, which is the data of this position value. So I can now tab to go into the node group and we wanna add the next position value to this one right here, so this white one. So I'm gonna click on it and then right here on the position, I can right click, let's click on add driver and then we can do the same thing. So right here on the type, I wanna change this to some values because we're working with number values. I then wanna click on the X here to get rid of this variable and let's click on add input variable to add a new one. And then I wanna change the ID type to material. So let's click on the prop and I can change it to material. And then here on the material dropdown, we want to select the current material that we're using. And then on the value here, I can press control V and then hit enter to paste that. And then again, you can click on update dependencies. So now you can see the position value has been dragged way over here. So what I want to do is click right here on this second color and you can see the position is 0.336. So I'm going to click on the position, press control C and that's going to copy the exact position number. Then I can hit the tab key to go out of the node group and here on color to position, I can click on this and I can press control V and then enter just to paste that. So now it looks the same, but I can now drag this around and that's gonna control the color ramp position. And then if you want to, you can also hit the tab key to go into the node group and right here on this color to position, I want the default value to be right here. So on the color to position right here on the default, I can click on this and then press control V and I can paste that exact value. And this will set the default position to that exact position value on the color to position. And right up here on color one position, this one I want the default value to be zero because it's over here on this side. So you can just continue to do that for as many as you want. So you could just do the black ones here, but you could also change it for the white ones as well. Um, and you could just continue to do that for all of them. I'm just going to do it one more time in this video, but in your own time, you could add drivers for any of these position values. So let's add the next one. So here on color three, I can click on this and then I can click on the plus here to add a new input. Then on the type here, again, I want to change it to float and then I want to rename the position. So I can now tab go outside of the node group and here's the color three position. So I want to right click on this and I want to click on copy data path. So I can now go back into the node group. So I'm going to click on the white one and then right click on the position and I can click on add driver. And then right here on the type, we want to change this to some values and then let's delete the variable and add a new variable. And then here on the ID type, let's change this to material. And then again, we want to select the current material. And then here on the path, you can press control V to paste that data and then hit enter, and then you can click on update dependencies. Now you can see again, this has been moved over. So if I go right down here, I wanna click on this color right here because that's where the position was. And for this one, I wanna hover my mouse over the position value and I wanna press control C to copy that value. Then I can hit the tab key to go out of the node group. And here on color three position, I can hover my mouse over that position and press control V to paste it. So now we can control that position. And also if I go back into the node group, here on color three position, here on the default value, I will press control V to paste that value. So again, you could continue to do that for this one here and also this one over here and this one, and you could just continue to do it for as many of the position values that you have. All right, so for my next example here, I just set up a very basic material. So I just have the texture coordinate and mapping with the object coordinates. Then I have this noise texture, and then I have the noise texture going into the color ramp. And the color ramp is going into the roughness. And so this way, some parts are more shiny and other parts are more rough. 
and I can drag these color ramp values around to make it more shiny or more rough. So just earlier in this video, I showed you how to add drivers to the position values if you want to move these values around. But there's actually another node which acts similar to the color ramp, which you can use in replace of the color ramp, and that way you don't have to add any drivers. And there are many cases where you still may want to use the color ramp, but let me show you this other node. So if I press Shift A and go to the search, I can search for the map range node. And let's drop this up here. And then I'm going to plug the factor into the value of this map range. And then I can replace the result for this color ramp right here. So I'm going to put it into the roughness. So when I did that, you can see it looks a little bit different, but I can now drag these minimum and maximum values of the map range, and that's going to act similar to a color ramp. So I'm actually going to hold down the shift key to make my movements more sensitive, and I can drag these values around. And you can see it's acting similar to the color ramp because it's making the values more contrast. So in many of your node setups, if you want to control a color ramp outside of a node group, it may be easier just to switch out a color ramp for a map range node. However, there are many cases where you would still want to use a color ramp. A few examples of this are if you want to have many different tabs. So let's say that I want to have like a mid gray color. I could hold down the control key, click here to add a tab, and then I could make this like a mid gray color and I could drag this around and it just gives you a little bit more control. Also, if you want to change the different colors, you could make like a blue color or like a red color and you can have many different colors and also another reason why you may want to use a color ramp is if you're using some of these other interpolations so for instance there's like a B spline here and this is going to change the fade between the two tabs or you may want it to be constant so if I change this to the constant now it's going to be super sharp now if you are using custom colors and you want to use a map range what you can do is press shift A you can go to the search and you can search for a mix node I'm going to drop this up here and I want to click on the float and I want to change it to color so that we're using color values. And then I want the map range result to be going into the factor. So then I can put the mix result into the principal shader and I will control shift and select the principal shader. So I can now just make two colors here for the mix. So I'm going to make maybe like a blue color and a red color. And then here on the minimum and maximum values on the map range, I can drag this around and I can make it more contrasty. I can also drag the two max and the two min if I want to make it even sharper. And to be able to see more of the blue, I need to turn the from minimum up. So I'll turn that way up so it's a bit sharper. So as you can see, the map range node does act very similar to a color ramp. So there may be many cases where you can just get rid of the color ramp and use the the map range instead. And why using the map range can be a lot easier for creating custom node groups is because I can box select all the nodes, I can press control G to join it together into a node group, and then we just have these values here that which we can plug into the group input, whereas the color ramp doesn't have those values to control. So I could put this one right up here, and then let me play around with some of these other ones. I think I want to control that one, so I'll put that up there. So then outside of the node group, if I make this bigger, I could drag this around, and it's basically doing the same thing as the drivers on a color ramp. All right, so the next thing I'm going to show you is how to control roughness values. And so for an example material, I've created this very basic material. It just has a noise texture going into the roughness, and then I have the metallic turned up, and I have the base color kind of dark, so we basically have this nice metal material. So I'm just going to box select these nodes, and then I'll press Control G to join it together into a node group. So now if I go inside the node group, let's say I want to control the roughness. Well, if your material has one single roughness value, then you probably don't have any texture plugged up to the roughness. So I could just plug the roughness here into the group input, and then outside of the node group, I could easily drag around the roughness. However, with many materials, you are probably using some sort of texture in the roughness, and adding a texture makes it look very cool because it makes some parts more rough and other parts more shiny. And so if I wanna control the roughness value, but I have a texture which is going into the roughness, then what I can do is just change the brightness and the darkness. Because if I press Shift A, go to the search, if I just search for a color ramp right here and drop this here, if I drag the black tabs out, there's going to be more black, and so it's going to be more shiny. However, if I drag the white out, it's going to be more rough. So I'm just going to delete this color ramp, and I'll plug the factor up to the roughness. So there's a really great node which we can use to change the brightness and the darkness. So if I press Shift A and go here to the search, I can search for the hue saturation value, and I can just put this before the roughness. So this value here is 
going to make the texture brighter or darker. And so we can just stick this here right before it goes into the roughness, and then we can control how rough and shiny the material is. But it is still using the texture of the noise. So then I can take the value and I can put that right in here to the extra socket. Let me press the N key to open the side panel. This was the old roughness value that we're not using, so I can hit the minus to get rid of it. And then this value, the value that you've plugged into the group input, we can just double click on this and I can just rename it to roughness. So then outside of the node group, I can drag this around and it's still using the texture, but it'll make the metal more rough or more shiny. So that's a really easy way to control the roughness value if you are using a texture in the roughness. And you could use this same method for making any values lighter or darker. So for another example, I have this material here and this has a noise texture and it is eventually going into the emission strength so that some of the material is actually emitting light. But if I wanted to easily control the brightness of the light, I could press shift A, go to the search, and I could search for the hue saturation value, and let's put this here before it goes into the emission strength, and then this value is going to make it lighter or darker. Then I can put the value here into the group input, and I could just call this like brightness, and then outside of the node group I have this brightness value that I can drag around. All right, for my next example, I've added in my procedural rocky planet material. Again, links in the description if you'd like to check out this material. But for this example, I've deleted all of the bump sliders. So if you wanna control the bump or the normal of the material, you can go into the node group and you can simply plug all the bump strengths up to the group input. So I'm just gonna click on the group input and drag it over here so that it is closer. And then you can take all the bump strengths and you can drag it right in here into the extra socket. Now this material has many different layers of bump, so if I wanted all of them to be controlled by one single value, I could take the bump strength and I could put that all into the same socket. However, if I do that, just note that it's going to use the same strength value for all the different bump strengths. So now if I go outside of the node group, I have this strength here, and I can make it more bumpy or less bumpy. I'm just going to press Ctrl Z though to undo that, or if I wanted to control them all individually, I could just add them here into a new socket and add them all into the new sockets here, and then I could just rename all the strengths. And so in this final rocky planet material, I have four different bump strengths. So I have the bump strengths of the mountain, also of the smaller craters, then also the land detail, and then finally the large craters. Now if you want to control the displacement of a material, for an example I've added in my rock cave wall, again links in the description if you'd like to check out this material. And I have this displacement strength slider to make the displacement more and less strong. And to control the displacement, if you go into the node group, you just need to take your displacement scale and you need to put that into the group input. And then you can just drag this around to control the displacement. So I'm now going to show you how to make sliders more and less sensitive. And for an example, I'm going to be using my procedural moss material. So right here on this moss factor gradient, we have this dot scale. And I can turn this up or turn it down if I want to make those dots bigger or smaller on the texture. Although with the dot scale, I have to drag it way up to like 100 to make it very small and all the way down just to maybe like a 5 if I want those dots to be very big. And if I compare that to like this dot's detail, I can just drag this between 0 and 1 to quickly change that. So if I want to make this slider more sensitive, there is an easy way to do that. So I'm just going to go into the node group. So what you can do is you can just go to whatever wire is plugged up to the value which you want to make more sensitive or less sensitive. And the one that I'm going to be using is the dot scale right here. So what you can do is you can add a math node and then you can use the math node to make the numbers more and less sensitive. So I'm going to press shift A, I'm going to go to the search and I'm going to search for a math node and I want to put the math node here here between the dot scale and the other texture. Now I actually want to take the dot scale and I want to put that into the bottom value right here. Now if you want to make the values more sensitive, we just need to multiply the values. So right here on this add, I want to click on this and I want to change it to multiply and then this value here is how much it's going to be multiplied. So for an example, I'll just start out with 10. So if I change it to 10, now if I go outside of the node group, I have this dot scale and I can just drag this around and it's much more sensitive now because if I turn the dots detail way down 
let's say I turn it down to like one, you can see how big the dots are. Then if I turn this up, you can see very quickly, just by turning this up to like a value of eight, those dots get very small. Whereas if I go back into the node group, if I click on this multiply and press the M key, that's gonna mute the node. So it's basically canceling the effect of the node. If I wanted to drag this way out and make the dots smaller, I'd have to drag this way out to a really big number like 100. So click on the multiply, I'm gonna press the M key to unmute it. So this multiply is going through the dot scale and so it's multiplying the value by a value of 10 and so that is making this dot scale much more sensitive and you can do the same thing if you want to make it less sensitive so for an example I have this gradient scale and you can see I don't drag the gradient scale very much uh, the gradient scale right now is turned to 1 or if I want to make it smaller I could just turn the gradient scale up to like 3 and you can see now the gradient is even smaller and I can drag it even just up to like a 6 or a 7 and the size of that gradient is very small. So if I want to have this be less sensitive, one way that I could very easily do this is just by holding down the shift key and then dragging the value, and that's going to make the movements more sensitive. But let's say that I didn't want to drag that around. What I can do is just add a math node and do the same thing, but we are going to divide the values instead of multiply. So I'm going to go here into the node group, and then right here we have the gradient scale. So I'm going to press shift A, I'm going to go to the search and I'm going to search for the math node and we want to put the math node right here in the wire after the gradient scale. To make it less sensitive, I want to click on the add here and I want to change it to divide instead. And then you want to take the gradient scale or whatever value you're using and you want to put that into the bottom socket. And then for this example, I'm going to turn the divide top value to a value of 30. So now if I go outside of the node group, we have this gradient scale and I can drag this around and you can see it is much less sensitive. So now if I want to make the gradient scale very big, I have to turn this all the way up to like 45 or 50. And then if I want to make this very small, I have to turn it all the way down to like a value of five. So that is how to make values more or less sensitive just by using these math nodes and changing the value. All right, so for my next example, I've added in my procedural lava material. And in this example, I'm going to show you how to add a value which will blend between two materials. So in this example here, in this lava material, if I go inside the material, I have this emission here, and that is the actual brightness of the lava. That's the uh, lava being emitted. And then this principled shader here, that is just the rock shader. So if I control shift and select this, you can see it's just a basic rock shader. But if I control shift and select this, that is the lava shader shader. And so I am joining these two different shaders together with this mix shader. Now to control where it's going to be one shader and where it's going to be the other shader, I have this noise texture here, and then I have this color ramp to make it more contrasty, and that is going into the factor of the mix shader. Now if I control shift and select this color ramp, this color ramp is controlling where it's going to be the rock and where it's going to be the lava. And so you can see I can drag this black tab around, and if I control shift and select the mix shader, that's going to blend between using more of the rock and more of the lava. So earlier in this video, I did show you how to add a basic driver to the position. And so if you wanted to control how much it's lava and how much it's rock, you could go back to that part with the timestamps in the description, and you could add a driver to this position value. However, there's actually a much easier way to do this. So this color ramp is going to make it brighter or darker. So if we can just control the brightness and darkness of this factor value, that's going to control how much it's going to be rock and how much it's going to be lava. So I can press shift A, I can go to the search, and I'm going to search for the hue saturation value. And in this case, the hue saturation value works a bit better if I put it before the color ramp, because the color ramp is controlling the contrast. And so if I put it after the color ramp, it doesn't work quite as well. But you can play around with this. So you might want to put a hue saturation value here after the color ramp. And now if I drag the value, you can see it is going to change it, but it's not really working how I want. It's just kind of making the lava brighter or darker. Whereas this hue saturation value, this one is before for the color ramp. So if I drag around this value, now it's going to control how much of the rock you can actually see. So you might need to put it before or after the color ramp. You can just try both and see which one you like better. So I don't need this one here. So with the hue saturation value selected, I can press control X and that's going to get rid of it, but it'll keep the wires plugged up. I'm just going to use this one instead. So I can now take the value of the hue saturation value and I can put that here into the group input and then just like all the other values, if you press the N key to open up the side panel, you can rename this. So if I go outside of the node group, I now have this lava amount here and so I can just drag this to make more lava or more rock.
All right, for my next example, I've just created a basic material with a principled shader, and then I have this magic texture, and the magic texture is going into the base color. And I'm using this magic texture because I want to show you how you can control a value which doesn't have a socket that you can use. So I've added this together into a node group. I've renamed it to magic texture. But here on the magic texture, we have this really cool depth value. But unfortunately, this magic texture depth doesn't have a dot here that we can put into the group input. And so if you watched the earlier part of the video where I add a driver to control the color and positions, we're going to do the exact same thing for this magic depth. So right here on the group input, what we can do is click on the plus here to create a new input. And then I can click on this to rename it, and I can rename it to magic depth. So if I go outside of the node group, this magic depth doesn't have anything plugged up to it, so it's not affecting the material. So what I want to do is copy the data path, just like we did earlier for the color ramp driver part of this video. So I'm going to right click on this, and then I want to click on the copy data path. And when you copy the data path, what it's going to do is it's going to copy this value here. So this bit of text here is what we copied when we right clicked here and clicked on copy data path. So we can now add the basic driver. So if I just go into the node group, we just want to add a driver to the depth. So I can right click and then let's click on add driver. Now right here on the type, we are working with number values. So here on the type, we want to change this to sum values. And then what we want to do is delete the variable and add a new one. So I can click on the X here to get rid of this. Let's click on add input variable. And here on the prop, we can click on this to change the ID type. And we want to change this to material because we're working with material. Materials. Then here on the drop down, there are quite a few materials here that I've added in the blend file, but you just want to select the material which you are currently using. So that is this one here. Now we have the path here, and this is where we're going to paste the data that we copied. So if I click on the path, I can press Control V then hit enter to paste that, and then you can just click on the update dependencies button. So now if I hit the tab key to go out of the node group, this magic depth is going to control the depth of the magic texture. So right here at the end of the video, I want to show you how you can use your custom node setups in other Blender projects, because this is a question that I very often get in the comments of my videos. So people will follow one of my tutorials or maybe create their own procedural material, but then they're wondering how they can use it in another Blender file. And there's actually three different methods methods for using a procedural material in another Blender file. So a really easy way to do this is to just append in the material data. So what you can do is just open up the new Blender file that you want to add the material in, and then you can click here on File, and you can click on Append. Then what you can do is just locate to the Blender file that you've saved, which has the material. And as an example, I'm going to go here to my procedural chunky rock material. So I'm going to double click on this blend file. And then what you can do is you can choose what you want to append. Now, in this case, we want to append materials. So let's go into the material folder. And then I want to click on the ch procedural chunky rock and I can click on append. And now that the data has been added into this blend file, you can go here to the materials, click on the drop down. Down, and here is the procedural chunky rock that I've just appended in. Now the second way to do this is to just copy and paste an object from one Blender file to another Blender file. So over here I have one Blender file, and then right over here, here's the other Blender file, and this one has my procedural mud material. So what you can just do is select an object which has the procedural mud material on it. You can then press Control C, and that is going to copy the object, and then if you click over here on the other Blender file on the other side of my screen, I can press Control V, and that is going to paste that object. And if I click on this object, you can see it has the procedural mud material. And we don't actually need this object, so I'll just hit X and then delete. But now we have that procedural mud in the Blender file because we copied over the object. So if I click on this object here, I can click on the drop down, and here's the procedural mud material. So I now have this material in this Blender file. But if you're very consistently using many different procedural materials that you've created, then the best way to do this is to add the materials as assets in Blender's asset browser. And this is where my ultimate procedural material pack comes in. So in my ultimate Blender procedural material pack, I've added all of my procedural materials and they're all pre-set up in Blender's asset browser. And they all have custom thumbnails and they've all been sorted into these different catalogs here. So you can easily find what you're looking for. So I could go right down here and I could click on the ground catalog. It's gonna show me all the ground materials. And then let's say I wanna use this dirt material. I can just drag the dirt material from the asset browser and I can drop it onto my object. 
and then all of my procedural materials in my procedural material pack has been added as customizable materials. So once you drop in a material, you can just open up the shader editor and there's all the different customizable settings so you can quickly change the material for each use. Now if you'd like to learn how to set up your own materials in the asset browser, then you can check out my tutorial on how to use the asset browser with the links in the description. Or if you'd like to help support me and my YouTube channel, then you can purchase my ultimate procedural material pack with the links in the description. And when you purchase my material pack, you'll get all of my procedural materials and you'll also get a blender file which has all the materials pre-set up in the asset browser. And if you'd like to purchase packs of 10 materials, you can also check out my procedural material pack. Or if you're just looking for a specific material, you can also purchase each material individually on my Gumroad store and my Patreon page. And if you'd like to learn how to create any of my procedural materials, you can also check out my procedural material tutorial playlist here on YouTube. So that's going to wrap it up for this video on how to create your own custom node groups in Blender. So I hope you found this video helpful and thank you for watching.